listening to Guy Annie. In 2011, I was hosted by the South African Council of Churches. I wanted to pay for my ticket uh, to the COP17 uh, Durban round on climate change. I was press gaming into write, uh, putting my name to a, a document, I guess it's in the realm of climate theology. And um, uh, my input was many as a social scientist, as an environmentalist. I don't consider myself a theologian and I don't consider myself a Christian. Um, but I was hosted by the SACC so that I could attend a uh, medical conference on climate health uh, where some 250 medical organizations representing medical professionals around the globe all met and we discussed issues to do with climate change and we ended up signing and my name is, uh, is on a document declaring climate change a medical emergency requiring drastic and urgent intervention and action. So this was now 2011 and what has puzzled me since then is why no action, right? You would, you would think that if you declared a medical emergency that there would, paramedics would arrive, and national defense would arrive, there would be some, some um, ripple effect. Um, it's only in recent times that issues that I'm going to be talking about today, uh, namely human extinction, have suddenly become uh, media popular, part of popular discourse. People want to talk about extinction, and here I am talking about it. Because it became abundantly clear that the narrative of climate change was what was at fault, where the, all the science Right, says that we, we're getting off the cliff and we've, we've gone through a series of tipping points and I'm going to map out some of these tipping points and some of the, the history if you give me uh, some time but just before we get there the issues to do with the narrative of climate change that really nobody here wants to talk about the weather right? and understandably being concerned about weather issues just <coughs> paint you into the world of the cuckoo and the you know, bonkers, mad, fringe of society because why would we be worried about the weather? Isn't this about existence on life itself? It's all about change and flux and temperatures always changing. The wind is always... I want to take you through there. I just want to just remind myself and remind everyone else that human beings currently are not on the the international red list, we're not considered an endangered species, right? So why am I here um, talking about human extinction? Um, before we... Last year, at uh, COP24, the naturalist environmentalist David Attenborough stated that climate change is humanity's greatest threat in 1,000 years. Um, the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, says we are in deep trouble with climate change. All right? So I'm going to go through this timeline here. It's a, a timeline of um, 50,000, so plus 10,000, so 60,000 years of human evolution. It's generally accepted that human beings arose during the mid Pleistocene, okay, and obviously there were earlier elements uh, such as Homo erectus, and there's a, a lot of science about um, paleoanthropology. But what I want to impress upon you is the period that began 10,000 years ago, which is generally accepted as the beginning of the Holocene, which is a period that um, is defined by so what what happened between the Pleistocene and the Holocene, right? Well, yes, there were human, some proto-humans during the Pleistocene, but that period was characterized by what is known as the Ice Age. 10,000 years ago, the glaciers receded, and human beings as we know them today, us, right, the modern human being, arose 
out of the savannas of Africa and the whole part of Africa um, um, idea. It's a theory which hasn't been shot down. It still uh, stands today that humans originated um, in Africa. I mean, everywhere there was landmass and the new landmasses that were uncovered by the receding glaciers. Um, and also, the, what, what happened then also was massive changes. The uh, continental Europe, for instance, because of the increase in sea level, you had um, quite drastic changes happening 10,000 years ago in terms of geography. So for 10,000 years, we've, we've, we've experienced a sta relatively stable period characterized by the, what is known as the interglacial period, by the recession of glaciers. Then what happens um, in the late, um, what is known as the 1800s, 17, around 1750, the steam engine changed everything. The beginning of industrial, industrial society, the industrialization of the human society, um, created unprecedented economic activity, economic <coughs> change, and you have the emergence of the railroads, and the Morse code, and the telegraph, and um, first industrial age. All right? I can I find my coke. Is there a coke? Right, so. This is like 10,000 years of history and I don't have a big board, but like, basically, let's just say 1760, right? As a point that marks on the beginning of the industrialization process. So, that industrial process it's still evident today, and we've gone through now we're into the fourth industrial revolution, which began with the information age in the late 90s. And the result of that information explosion has been also unprecedented economic activity and the um, creation of new wealth and major cities which have arisen in the past decade, like Shanghai and Dubai and all these cities which didn't exist in the, in the way that they do. The, the world that I grew up in the 70s, 80s, and 90s was characterized by Western um, powers, the empire, where the major cities were like New York and Chicago and London, and then you had like Hong Kong in the east, and that was pretty much it, it you know, the, the European cities. But we've had this massive industrialization of the East. So why, where am I? So, uh, the science of climate change, so there are two uh, points that one needs to reference. The one is the, this graph, which is the hockey stick curve of global temperature. There's a lot of controversy over global temperature and the hockey stick curve because there was a dispute going all the way back to the 80s. And I urge people to read this book, Merchants of Doubt, which explains why um, the same people who were behind denialism in the tobacco industry were also behind denialism in climate change. Anyway, the consensus position in science that's, that has emerged based upon the hard evidence and the data demonstrates that global temperatures have gone through exponential increase over the past relatively short period of time and then it's a result of human intervention um, in, in the environment. It's human activity, nothing else. It's not um, meteorites, it's not um, creatures from outer space, it's human intervention that has created uh, global warming. So global warming is a fact, a fact of life. The other point that people need to look at is that the, the, decree, the slope of decrease in ice. And the slope is going down and the global temperatures are going up. Currently we're at uh, 411 parts per million CO2. 
I'm sure I don't have to tell everyone why CO2 is important in climate change, but it's a, it's a greenhouse gas and it, it traps the uh, incoming radiation, the energy that comes from the sun, traps it in, on the planet, and the result, result is global temperature increase. Okay, so I'm not a climatologist, I'm a social scientist. And I guess what my job here as, as an activist is really reporting back on what other eminent scientists have learned. And I can show you some of the, see the, I'm looking for my um, notes here. All right. Um, I've got several uh, pieces of uh, scientific literature which I need to traverse. But before I do that, I just want to give you um, some insights to the story. So, last year, the H2O crisis it was the same time last year. Was, right. Same time last year, the H2O crisis, right? Um, we, Cape Townians, experienced sudden change in our environment. We experienced a, a, a drought that broke records, and people became very concerned about climate change. And I became also very concerned. So I wrote a piece uh, on the end of the Anthropocene to try and drum up some kind of support and to try and look at the theory of where, where are we in science. Surprisingly, there are um, published papers. The one that I am very interested in um, is a piece by Burke and Williams, which uh, states that the Pliocene and Eocene provide best analogues for near future climates. To quote, by 2030, Earth's climate is expected to resemble that of um, the mid-Pliocene, which was 5.2 million years ago. By 2050, they say the climate will resemble the ice-free Eocene, which was 13 degrees hotter, which was 50, 56 million years ago. Uh, there's another uh, paper that I read this morning, uh, looking at paleoclimate constraints um, Impact of 2 degree anthropogenic warming and beyond by Fisher et al. They say future global warming may, may eventually be twice as warm as projected by current climate models. And more severe climate uh, predictions could, could be the most accurate. Okay? There's greater future global warming inferred from Earth's recent energy budget. Last year was the biggest uh, greenhouse gas. Um, uh, event in Earth's history, right? We, like a freight train, an unstoppable force that, that everything we tried to do has actually resulted in the opposite. We had an increase in greenhouse gas. So, what is to come? By 2030, because we've got to go through exponential change. So, the, the thing about exponential change is like the difference between Day one and day two is like the difference between World War One and World War Two. Mm. You can think about it that way, right? So like the difference between day one, day two, and day three in an exponential graph is the difference between World War One, World War Two, and the rest of history, like the 21st century. You, you go through um, the timeline so that you can predict based on your loss of ice and the increase in global temperature, if you continue along this trajectory, which is a worst case scenario trajectory, by 2030, we're in a period which is no longer the Holocene, which is our cradle. We're in a period that is very different. It's a malignant cycle that's associated with this planet, which is anywhere between 13 and 20 degrees hotter. Anyone who knows any science about um, the human body, this is, medics can tell you that the body's internal temperature, right, it's roughly about like 32 degrees, that you're, there's, there's a, a, a formula known as the wet bulb global temperature, which measures relative humidity and, and internal heat. And it's used by medics to determine how long you can survive in a desert. And if you go down a mine shaft, how long you can work is going to be exposed to heat. So I don't have to um, explain why it is that if we increase the global temperature by 17 degrees, that human beings will not exist as we know it. 
And then what, what we're moving into is a period of massive disruption and massive change of the kind that has occurred in Chicago where the temperature, because of the collapse of the polar vortex, was some uh, was 46 degrees under. We had uh, problems with frostbite within 10 minutes if you walked in the street without, without gloves, right? So the dis destabilization of the entire uh, climate that, that has characterized us has been upgraded for 10,000 years. Where Australia's burning up, where Chicago's experiencing extreme cold. You have this, this extreme environment because the the, the biostasis has now been disrupted. So, I'll give you an example. So, the polar vortex has collapsed because the Gulf Stream, the, the, the jet stream that keeps the, the ice cold, has collapsed because there's less ice on the on the right. There's less ice on the the uh, North Pole. Um, so, what happens after humans are gone? We will still be around, but we won't be human. We'll be something that is post-human. The post-human epoch is upon us. We are moving into a period where the only surviving humans will be living in artificial habitats. We will be wiped out. The cause is a, is not, wasn't just releases of CO2 through basalt eruption. It was complications that arrive as a result of CO2 release. So methane hydrate at the bottom of the ocean, which emerges, and it's, methane is a, a very much a more powerful greenhouse gas than CO2. It's a really short, relatively short-lived molecule. Uh, you can get rid of it faster, but it's, it's more active in terms of its ability to, to create um, warmer. Right. So 250 million years ago, most of life on planet Earth was eviscerated and obliterated. 